Hey everyone, I'm Michael Short. Come on, let's go outdoors. You know, for over a decade now, I've been covering the water crossing issues along the Swan River drainage. And recently I returned to this area. Of course, the uh, Swan River is a major tributary going into Lesser Slave Lake. It's also home to Arctic grayling. Here in Alberta, the Arctic gray lane are a threatened species. Fragmentation and sedimentation have resulted in habitat loss and access to traditional spawning tributaries. Organizations like Alberta Conservation Association have been monitoring and conducting grayling surveys in the area since the early 2000s. Looking at all the stream crossings, um, interestingly in 2002, 70% of the culverts were functioning as barriers to fish passage. In 2015, that had increased to 90%, so the trajectory was not positive and the quantified results were really disturbing. That's like almost every culvert in the watershed, a fish couldn't get up through to get to a different piece of habitat. Along with the degradation of grayling habitat, there has also been a high social cost. What I remember back is uh, about our water, how important the water was. And uh, we got our water source from the wells, uh, the, you know, digging by hand and making sure that was one of the sources. And also from any flowing river, streams, and also the muskeg, that was a best water that could ever be. And uh, as the years went by, you start seeing the change, and uh, the change was in, uh, I could say, the 50s, where it was, you know, you could start seeing things were not the way it used to be. The land base around the Swan Hills River has been busy. Oil and gas, forestry and agriculture have all taken their toll. During these early days of industry expansion, little attention was paid to the environmental impact. Times are changing. Some companies are putting boots on the ground and correcting past mistakes regarding water crossings. Until recently, there was lots of, lots of discussion about uh, the sort of liabilities or, of these uh, legacy fields. And so we, as a company, were fully aware of, of those, those, uh, those undertakings that we had to look after. So the culverts that you, you looked at today were what I would call our legacy culverts. So they were identified by um, the Swan River First Nation and uh, I think it was the Alberta Conservation Association in a report in 2014 or 15. And um, we've undertaken to, to start to look after them. So uh, as I said, you know, you take on the liability when you take on a new field. Another positive step has been that companies are investing money and time into understanding how many water crossings they're responsible for and to what degree these crossings impact fish movement. So I think the best thing that's happening in industry right now is the inspections and getting an inventory of those inspections. So ideally, um, operators can change their focus from compliance-based inspections and fixing random crossings to having a good list of their priorities, understanding what watershed they're in, and make sure they're fixing the highest priority watersheds. Um, so if we can focus on that and start with those, you know, uh, your top watersheds, your species at risk, um, you know, the bigger crossings, the most upstream habitat, I think if we can stick with that method of repairing crossings, we'll see a bigger impact than, than doing random ones all over the country. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm really proud of the work of our, our technical teams have done. They've gone and interview, um, inventoried our entire uh, field of all the water crossings that we have, uh, identified the fluvial, non-fluvial, any, that, any um, streams that may have any habitat, risk to habitat for fish, um, and then also we've incorporated some of the other ones that were identified by third parties, AER, AEP, and then also the Swan River First Nation. So we have about, uh, we have 159 stream crossings in our field.
in our inventory, as part of also the reports that were identified, as I said, the factors we look at in terms of uh, doing uh, restoration work, um, we identified approximately 16 of those, uh, of those crossings that were of, of concern. Uh, we've completed work on nine of those and we have seven remaining. And we have a program sort of to do it over a period of, of time uh, and working in collaboration with the AER and other industry groups uh, with regards to that. that. You can't, this field is made up of multiple uh, operators, multiple industries, so you have to sort of, uh, collaboration is a real key component to uh, our work here. And that collaboration extends beyond other industry partners to include community leaders from the Swan River First Nation. Yeah, well, actually, um, I really appreciate you saying that because um, when I first joined Aspen Leaf, we had a fairly heated discussion with Swan River First Nation about our water crossings. And it's been a real commitment from our management team as well as our field staff in addressing that issue. In fact, the collaboration has gone. We've actually contributed to some of the fish studies, that the stream studies that they've been doing. So that gives us that, that information firsthand. And um, like I'm really, you know, proud of the work that they've done. Uh, one of their current counselor, uh, Ryan Davis, was really instrumental in how we work together to come up with that approach. And so, you know, when I look at Swan Hills and, and working with the communities, to me, it's just a natural way of doing business. And and uh, I'm fortunate that I have a management team and a group of uh, field professionals that are all part of that. Being able to see tangible results in habitat restoration is what the Swan River First Nation is expecting. We've been doing consultation, um, not just Swan River, but most nations in Treaty 8 Alberta have been doing consultation on a, on a pretty high level for uh, uh, over 10 years now. So it's really been a long process over time, uh, getting these guys working with different biologists and stuff like that. A lot of it was like, um, as soon as we started reaching out for other sources of funding and looking at what's available um, to do studies and stuff, and then we would just find partners like, okay, if that's a aquatic study, then we'll find a, a biologist that, that we could partner with and do those type of studies. So um, Megan and, and the watershed is a good example. Um, we saw the work that they were doing and we just said, you know, we, we'd like to be involved any way we can. Um, yeah, so just reaching out to partners, um, looking for what funding is available, and then just letting like all parties know that we're interested in these aspects of what goes on in our territory. Another key partner is the Lesser Slave Watershed Council, which, among its many roles, provides water quality monitoring. Yeah, so the Watershed Council has been conducting tributary water quality monitoring since 2017. This originated as uh, out of our, our watershed planning project when we realized that there really wasn't enough information to accurately assess the condition of our tributaries that are flowing into Lesser Slave Lake. So um, we worked with a consultant to put together a program that we could implement ourselves year after year and collect that baseline information. So we've been sampling uh, 15 sites on the five major tributaries flowing into Lesser Slave. And uh, with special attention to the Swan, we've partnered with Swan River First Nation to collect additional information on the Swan, uh, metals, dissolved metals, and a handful of other parameters. Uh, hexavalent chromium is in particular uh, toxic to fish. So that additional information is funded by them and it gives us a little bit better understanding of what's going on in this particular sub-basin. Determining where grayling may be located within this vast river system is a task the Swan River First Nation has taken on by forming an environmental monitoring team. Um, so we're doing the eDNA samples to see if there's any DNA of the grayling, or the grayling in the streams. And these guys are doing one downstream sample and then one midstream sample and one upstream sample. And at the end of it all, we do a controlled sample to run through the lab so that there's no contamination. If there's, if there's uh, eDNA, if there's grayling eDNA in the control, then we know we cross-contaminated somewhere. So, so that's the reason for the control. So we do four, four samples per site. And in a season, how many sites would you, would you visit? Uh, well, typically, it's all, it all varies. But last year we did, I think, uh, we did 27. 
and this year we're kind of projected to do 30, 35. When you look at the size of the land base here, you have a sense of percentage what that those 33 sites would represent? Well, it, it, would cover, it would cover the majority of the Swan River watershed, for sure. And have you been given any of the results of the work that you guys have been doing? Do you have a sense of, of what these results are yielding? Yes, uh, last year we did Arctic grayling eDNA and we did metabarcoding, which consists of all the different types of fish in the water. And we did get some hits on grayling, so we're kind of revisiting, prioritizing the sites of the ones where we got Arctic grayling. So. That's got to be satisfying. Yeah, for sure. And it's a big thing. When I was growing up, I used to always come fish, go hunting and then fish along the way and kind of eat some fish while we're hunting. And now we can't do that. I can't share that same experience with my daughters. So I've never actually seen a grand in my life. Seriously? Mm hmm Really? I can't remember ever seeing one. That's... How does that make you feel? Uh, pretty bad. Now a lot of work remains to be done in this area, but partnerships and cooperation seem to be moving things forward. And perhaps in his lifetime, young Stiles may have an opportunity yet to see his first wild grayling. Till next time everyone, I'm Michael Short. Come on, let's go outdoors.